their professors and colleagues. It is a very good opportunity to have a Professor uh, Mona Rushdie with us uh, this day to speak about a very hot issue, management of dyslipidemia in chronic kidney disease and renal transplant patients. It is very difficult to speak about dyslipidemia in these categories of patients because the evidence-based medicine in the category of CKD, dialysis, and transplantation is lacking. Professor uh, Mona Rushdie is the Professor of Internal Medicine and Nephrology at Cairo University, Qasr al Aini Medical School. All of us are uh, proud of uh, Qasr al Aini and all the team, especially Professor Muna and Professor May, uh, because uh, they, they uh, have a fantastic attitude toward uh, supporting uh, the, all the community. Uh, Professor Muna is the former director of Qasr al Aini Kidney and Transplantation Center, and she participated in many national and international conferences as speaker or chairperson in the field of internal medicine, diabetes, and nephrology. Uh, Professor Muna is a reviewer in Saudi Journal of Kidney Disease and Transplantation, Qasr al Aini Medical uh, Journal. Uh, we uh, were honored to have Professor Muna with us early this year within the clinical examination of MD Nephrology at Mansoura University with uh, the, our beloved friend, Professor Tariq Fayyad from Qasr al Aini Medical School as well. It is an honor and a pleasure to have both of them with us at that date. And this is from Transplantation Chapter to 2019. As you see, Professor May in the heart of the meeting and all other, uh, all uh, professors and the colleagues uh, from all over Egypt. And this is the uh, data registry meeting that was held in Qawloon uh, Arab. Professor May, Professor Saeed Khamis is attending this meeting, Professor Tari, Professor Kamal, and Professor Hani, the president of the Society of Nephrogen Transplantation. And this is the Professor May during the uh, ASNT conference uh, early this year, when she spoke uh, clearly about the evolving data registry in Egypt. And, this, and I hope that we can meet again freely because I think virtual meetings are fantastic, but we should uh, meet together even if on a level of infrequent meetings. Today, I'm sure that uh, we'll, we will be delighted by the uh, Professor Mona to speak about this hot issue in medicine, nephrology, and transplantation. And before Professor Mona will start, I would like to declare that all ESCNT, CME, and distance learning meetings are free of any company or industrial affairs or uh, promotions. So this is just to uh, remind you. Uh, I would like to stop here and uh, until Professor Mona share her slides, I'm leaving the mic to Professor May Hasaballah. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Hussein. And uh, again, I'd like to thank you for these very important meetings. You are not only initiating them, but you're also maintaining them. And this is very important, actually, and very educational. And I'd like to welcome Professor Mona Rushdie. She is, uh, of course, she is the Professor of Internal Medicine and Nephrology, Cairo University School of Medicine. And she is a very dear friend. And I'm sure she will be giving us uh, a great talk on a subject that is unfortunately uh, overlooked by many uh, uh, nephrologists, uh, though it's a very important subject and it is very prevalent as well. And it does impact on the cardiovascular um, uh, uh, risks and on the renal functions as well. So please, Professor Mona, you can uh, start now. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. May. Thank you, Professor Dr. Hussein. Uh, I will, my presentation today is about this epidemia in uh, chronic kidney disease and after renal transplantation. Uh, I will try to highlight briefly the following points. Uh, uh, first, uh, the, the definition of this epidemia or what's meant by this epidemia and if it is synonymous with hyperlipidemia or not. Uh, I will highlight the renal function and its relation to the cardiovascular risk. Um, I will describe briefly uh, normal life 
and protein metabolic pathway in order to better understand the pathophysiology of this lipidemia in CKD dialysis and transplantation patients. I will uh, highlight uh, with uh, uh, the, evidence, the, uh, the evidence that we have so far, uh, the epidemiologic association between this lipidemia and cardiovascular outcome in CKD, uh, and uh, what other consequences this lipidemia may have, and what uh, benefits can we gain by uh, lipid-lowering treatment other than cardiovascular disease protection. Uh, then I will uh, try to highlight the important guidelines, the Kidigo, and also in comparison to other guidelines, uh, uh, and also the different lipid lowering drugs which are available and used in the clinics. Uh, I will highlight the role of nutrition and uh, the, um, the different uh, nutritional uh, um, um, tools or regimens or uh, programs that can be done to uh, improve the lipid profile of the patient. Uh, the, also, we have um, uh, the pediatric uh, uh, group. Uh, which are different from the other uh, patients. And so uh, the difference between them, uh, I will try to highlight it in the following point. And uh, the, also uh, briefly about the emerging lipid lowering treatments uh, and new drugs in, low, in treatment of this lipidemia. Uh, as I uh, said before, this lipidemia is not synonymous with hyperlipidemia, as renal function changes the level, composition, and the quality of the lipids in favor of more atherogenic profile. It is not, uh, uh, the, uh, it is not uh, meant that they are, uh, this is associated with increased low, uh, low density lipoprotein level or increased level of uh, cholesterol, but uh, the, um, the chronic kidney disease is associated with increased levels of very low density lipoproteins and increased, uh, decreased high density lipoproteins despite normal total cholesterol level. Uh, regarding the renal function and the cardiovascular uh, risk, there is a graded inverse relationship between the estimated GFR and the cardiovascular disease, which is independent of age, sex, and other conventional cardiovascular risk factors. This relationship is present even in the setting of minor renal impairment. Patients with end-stage renal disease who require dialysis have an extremely high risk of cardiovascular events. And uh, the prevalence of hyperlipidemia, which is the most common form of this lipidemia, was estimated to be as high as 80% in patients with kidney transplants. Uh, the cardiovascular mortality still accounts for approximately 50% of all deaths in the kidney transplant recipients. Uh, regarding the, um, it is important to uh, have an idea about the normal lipoprotein metabolic pathways in order to have a better understanding of the lipid profile of the patients with CKD. Uh, here we have the lipids, they are absorbed from the intestine. Uh, they need a protein uh, to carry them in the circulation, so they are carried with lipoproteins uh, in the form of chylomicrons. Uh, the, there is uh, also uh, there is the lipoprotein lipase which uh, tries a uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to digest or to break these chylomicrons into small into free fatty acids to be taken by the muscles and the adipose tissues and the chylomicron uh, here that is taken by the muscles and adipose tissue and the chylomicron remnants go to the liver. Liver uh, synthesizes also the lipoprotein little a, which has an importance, and I will mention it later uh, in my presentation. Uh, then the lipid, uh, the, there is the endogenous pathway where the, uh, where the liver synthesizes the very low density lipoproteins and the inter intermediate density lipoproteins and the low density lipoproteins, which, if present in excess, uh, it will uh, lead to deposition in the macrophage and be and is atherogenic. Uh, or uh, this is the, 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 the way uh, it goes back to the liver, or it will, uh, when in excess, will deposit in macrophage cells and leads to atherosclerosis. Uh, the reverse cholesterol transport is uh, one of the protective mechanisms, the high density lipoprotein precursors uh, carry the lipids from the periphery back to the liver. And so this is the uh, normal lipoprotein metabolic pathway, which is uh, subject to alterations in patients with CKD and uh, in patients with, uh, with uh, transplantation. Uh, here we have a reminder only of the different lipoproteins because we will mention them uh, later. The chylomicron is important in transport of dietary triglyceride. Uh, here we find in apolipoproteins that it contains the lipoprotein B, um, uh, B48s and the different types of lipoproteins. Uh, very low density lipoproteins uh, is important in transport of endogenous uh, triglycerides from the liver to the peripheral tissues. Intermediate density lipoproteins usually present in small concentrations but elevated uh, in kidney failure. LDL is important in transport of cholesterol from the liver again to the peripheral tissues. The high density lipoprotein is uh, the only 
the lipoprotein, which is important in, uh, in uh, transport of cholesterol from the peripheral to, uh, uh, to the liver back uh, to the li to the liver back and the lipoprotein little a um, is uh, not known uh, how what is the physiological function but it leads to uh, the inhibition of fibrinolysis and predisposed to thrombosis it is uh, correlated with cardiovascular disease and uh, we will uh, highlight it also later in this presentation um, what is the, the, the pathophysiology of this lipidemia and what uh, will change in the patients with CKD and dialysis trans uh, and transplantation? Here we find that uh, there is uh, many factors which contribute to hypertriglyceridemia in those patients. Uh, first, uh, there is increased hepatic synthesis of very low density lipoproteins, which leads to increased hypertriglyceridemia, uh, which is caused by impaired low, uh, carbohydrate tolerance. And on the other hand, there is decreased catabolism of triglycerides due to decreased activity of lipoprotein lipase. There are other factors which may contribute as secondary hyperparathyroidism and suppressed insulin level. And in patients with hemodialysis, uh, heparinization uh, uh, leads to an increase in plasma APOC3 and APOC2. Uh, the, the decreased and there is uh, alteration in this ratio. Uh, so, and also there is um, increase in other lipase inhibitors. So there is a decreased catabolism of triglycerides. The accumulation of remnant particles as chylomicron remnants and intermediate density lipoproteins. This is the main uh, pathological uh, problem uh, in, the, in the lipid profile of CKD patients. Uh, the second one is the reduced high density lipoprotein. This is caused by low APOE1 level and decreased lecithin cholesterol aside transferase activity conversion of HDL3 to HDL2. Uh, and there is also uh, reduced paraoxonase activity in patients with CKD, so predisposing the LDL and possibly the HDL particles to oxidation. Uh, so we see that in patients with the CKD, the main, uh, to the summarize, there is increase in the triglyceride level, in the, the reduced HDL level, and increased oxidation, which leads, which promotes uh, the, the process of atherosclerosis. Uh, but we have to know that uh, the CKD population is heterogeneous. It, uh, it, we may see different patterns of uh, lipid uh, dyslipidemia. As we have the chronic kidney disease from stages to one to five, the nephrotic syndrome patients, the hemodialysis patients, and the peritoneal dialysis. Also, there was uh, differences in the modality of dialysis. Uh, if we uh, also uh, look uh, at the patients uh, um, in, uh, in, um, in the detailed pattern, uh, there is uh, also studies about hemodialysis with patients with high flux dialyzers uh, leading to uh, Im improvement in the pattern of HDL and uh, increasing level of HDL. Uh, so we, uh, when we see this table, we find that um, uh, here, the triglyceride is elevated in all types of uh, uh, diseases, uh, 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 I mean all the patterns of the chronic kidney disease. Uh, they are especially uh, much elevated uh, in the nephrotic syndrome, but they are uh, here uh, in CKD 1 to 5, they are rising from stage 1 to stage 5. And uh, the triglyceride is, uh, in, is elevated in all uh, is on all diseases, as we say. The HDL here is reduced also in all types of uh, chronic kidney disease, necrotic and hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients. Uh, here we have the LDL cholesterol, which is not uh, of the same pattern in all types. Here it is uh, also may rise from a stage uh, one to five. It is elevated, as we all know, in the nephrotic syndrome. Uh, however, in the hemodialysis patients is uh, usually normal or reduced. And the peritoneal dialysis patients, they are elevated. Uh, here we, ha we have also this APO uh, if four and is, uh, this uh, lipoprotein is a target of study, as I will mention a, a study uh, addressing those uh, parameters later. The APOB uh, is also important. It is the main constituent in the LDL and A lipoprotein little a. Uh, they are uh, here, they are uh, elevated in different types. However, the hemodialysis patient, as we see, uh, shows a lower level of APOB. Uh, so the characteristic of uremic dyslipidemia, it shows, again, hypotriglyceridemia, increased remnant lipoproteins, reduced HDL, increased lipoprotein little a and APOA4. Elevated LDL cholesterol level is not typical, but can mostly observed in patients with nephrotic syndrome and PD patients as a summarization of the previous uh, table. Uh, in patients with transplantation, we can see uh, both uh, patterns, the hypercholesterolemia and the hypertriglyceridemia. It is um, the factors leading to hypercholesterolemia are genetic predisposition, 
age, excessive dietary intake of cholesterol and saturated fat, obesity, proteinuria, antihypertensive drugs, diuretics, beta blockers, corticosteroids, and calcium inhibitors. Hypertriglyceridemia may be caused by genetic predisposition, excessive dietary intake of carbohydrates, obesity, proteinuria, renal insufficiency, corticosteroids, and uh, sirolimus and the mammalian target of rapamycin. How uh, the, the, the important uh, difference in the, or the important contributor in patients with transplantations are the drugs, uh, the immunosuppressive uh, drugs uh, they, uh, we are using. Uh, so uh, when we look at the corticosteroids, the corticosteroids leads to insulin resistance, which increases the hepatic uptake of free fatty acids, very low density lipoprotein, and also uh, there is increased conversion of very low density lipoprotein to LDL, increasing the level of LDL. There is down regulation of LDL receptors, and so the levels in the blood increases. Also, reduction in the lipoprotein lipase leads to reduced triglyceride clearance. Uh, regarding uh, cyclosporin, cyclosporin interferes with the binding of LDL cholesterol to the LDL receptor. So there is decline in the LDL clearance, leading to the rise in LDL. Uh, also, the cyclosporin is very lipophilic, so it can be transported in the core of LDL cholesterol particles and changing the character. As we mentioned earlier, the, 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 this lipidemia is about the quality of lipoproteins. They are disturbed. Mechanism of uh, other drugs, as sirolimus, may inhibit the lipoprotein in a, a lipase. It leads to overproduction of lipoproteins in general, decreased in apolipoprotein B100 meta uh, catabolism, and increases the activity of tissue lipase, increases the creation of very low density lipocholesterol, uh, like LD, uh, very LDL cholesterol. Um, the epidemiologic association. Um, here we see the difference between the general population and the CKD patients. Uh, so starting from this point in the lecture, I will try to highlight the evidence as we have, and we interpret the different studies uh, we have uh, regarding uh, the, the, the use of statin and uh, the use of uh, lipid-lowering drugs and if they are protective or not. Uh, so if we compare the CKD patients as we explained so far, the difference between them in the lipid profile and in the risk factors, and, uh, and um, they, are, so they are different from the general population. Uh, when they did uh, studies uh, regarding the general uh, population, they found a clear linear relationship between the plasma cholesterol concentration and the risk of coronary heart disease and ischemic stroke. And they found that for every uh, one millimole, which is equivalent to 40 milligram increase in LDL cholesterol, the risk of coronary heart disease increases by 40%. And so there is um, a clear benefit of lowering the blood cholesterol. Uh, so here we observe the first difference that the not all patients with chronic kidney disease have elevated low density lipoproteins and that the pattern is different from the general population. Uh, when they started to do the studies for uh, the, the lipid-lowering therapy in CKD, uh, they first uh, wanted to, uh, to investigate the safety. So they did uh, the studies, to, uh, take two, uh, two, uh, two, the, these two studies, uh, one or uh, two of the important studies that they started with to uh, de detect the efficacy and the safety. If uh, there is a, a side effects of the drugs, which is known uh, why with um, a CK, um, CPK elevation or abnormal liver enzyme function. And uh, then uh, there is uh, the, the following uh, is the, the study is one of the most important studies uh, maybe the, 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 the single one, which uh, showed that the effects of lowering the LDL cholesterol with simvastatin plus azetimib, which is the SHARP trial. The SHARP trial uh, had the question to uh, what, uh, whether the lowering of LDL cholesterol in patients with CKD could reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, non-hemorrhagic stroke, and the need for revascularization procedures. And here we see the uh, graph that uh, it, uh, the, 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 on the left, the column on the left shows the simvastatin plus azetimib. Um, they used a simvastatin a 20 and azetimib a 10. And uh, we will highlight, uh, or we'll stress on the doses of the, uh, of these, uh, of the statins or the, in the lipid lowering drugs uh, later in this presentation. Uh, but they added here azetimib uh, to simvastatin in order uh, not, to, um, not to, to increase the doses or to use a higher dose of simvastatin. And uh, they tried to, uh, uh, to reach lower level of LDL. Uh, so uh, the reduction of LDL cholesterol with the simvastatin 
plus SAC mean 10 daily safely reduce the incidence of major atherosclerotic events in a wide range of patients with advanced chronic disease. Uh, so the, these patients included in the study were chronic kidney disease and a small portion was dialysis patients. Uh, then we have two important studies for the dialysis patients, with our, which are the 4D study and the Aurora study. Both patients, uh, both studies uh, also wanted to detect the, uh, the, the outcomes of lowering the low-density lipoprotein, low-density low cholesterol, LDL, uh, and they um, have to, uh, they wanted to detect that if the, this is protective against the major a cardiovascular outcome or not. However, both trials demonstrated that statin therapy offers no significant benefit to patients already undergoing dialysis. And so they can, couldn't find uh, any benefit of using the statins or the, 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 the lipid lowering drugs in this group of patients. So we have evidence regarding using the lipid lowering of the statin uh, together with ezetimib in patients with CKD, but we don't have any evidence of uh, benefit in patients with dialysis. So why are, uh, where uh, didn't work? Why did they, these drugs didn't work in patients with dialysis? Uh, this is because um, first, uh, the first thing, uh, the first answer for this question, we answered it before, because these patients don't have LDL, uh, elevated LDL, they have a different pattern of dyslipidemia, and also the pathophysiology of spectrum of cardiovascular is different compared to that of the general population. Uh, they have other pathogenetic problems other than atherosclerosis, as arterial stiffness, vascular calcification, left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, congestive cardiovascular myopathy and sudden cardiac death from arrhythmia. So in many studies, the cause of death is not atherosclerotic and ischemic heart disease, but maybe in patients with dialysis, as we all know, it is a, a sudden cardiac death from arrhythmia, and uh, these patients have left ventricular, uh, 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 they ha have heart failure or congestive cardiomyopathy. Uh, they have also, this group of patients also have um, other uh, risk factors. Uh, the conventional risk or traditional, as we say, uh, uh, risk factors of diabetes, uh, male patient, uh, hypertension, physical activity, obesity, smoking, and high LDL and genetic predisposition. But they also have other risk factors, uremic milieu, anemia, abnormal mineral metabolism, hyperphosphatemia, calcium load, and elevated PTH, dialysis vintage, over, uh, uh, fluid overload, oxidative stress, malnutrition, chronic inflammation, and increased asymmetric uh, dimethyl RGD. Uh, moreover, uh, low dense lipoproteins, uh, uh, LDL, uh, LDL cholesterol levels in uh, cardiovascular disease uh, are, uh, uh, sorry, LDL levels in uh, patients with hemodialysis are already uh, depressed and they are not a good marker uh, as uh, assessing cardiovascular risk. Uh, the explanation for this is that coexisting malnutrition and inflammation may modify the relationship between cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. The patients on dialysis um, uh, have LDL level, which uh, has a negative association with all cause mortality at below average levels and a flat or weakly positive association at higher levels. The relationship which holds the patients on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis and when cardiovascular death is considered as a separate outcome is often referred to as reverse epidemiology or reverse causality for the risk factor paradox. Some studies show a J-curve association with increased mortality among patients with end-stage renal disease who have very low or very high HDL cholesterol level. Okay, uh, so these patients uh, with on hemodialysis, when they have very uh, lowered uh, LDL, uh, they are uh, a more at more risk of increased mortality and uh, more risk in, uh, uh, to adverse events. Uh, what about patients with, uh, with transplanted patients, post-transplantation? Uh, it has been estimated that increased LDL cholesterol Concentration by 2 millimole doubles the risk of major card adverse cardiac events. The low level of HDL cholesterol has been associated with a threefold increase in the post-transplant maze and also an increase in all-cause mortality. Uh, 
um, the renal transplant patients are at, at risk, a great risk of cardiovascular disease, and uh, they, uh, they are, this, uh, there is an important study uh, including those patients, uh, the post-transplantation patient, which is the ALERT study. Uh, the ALERT study didn't uh, show only uh, non-significant um, tend towards the reduction of cardiovascular, major cardiovascular outcomes uh, in uh, the patients. However, uh, this was confirmed, the beneficial effect of the drug, the reduction in the cardiac death was confirmed in the alert extension study when the study was extended, as we see here from the graph, to six uh, or seven years here. It is extended to seven years, and it showed that um, uh, flu, flu, uh, patients randomized to fluvastatin have reduced risk of MACE and 29 reduction in cardiac death or definite non-fetal myocardial infarction. Total mortality and graft loss did not differ significantly, and I will return to this back, the graft, uh, what uh, the graft, um, and the effect of lipid lowering and the graft loss. I will refer to this again. Uh, so this, the, 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 um, when we observe that the, these uh, drugs, uh, which act primarily on lowering the LDL, are not beneficial because the patients, the CKD patients, as we said, have different dyslipidemic dis profile. Uh, now we see that uh, we, we have to work on this profile. We have to detect it. And we have to uh, try to correlate it with the, the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And this, as we can see in this study, which was published in, uh, published in American Journal of Kidney Disease uh, in 2019, January 2019. Uh, here, the, they included 3,800 patients. And they uh, measured the uh, uh, very low density lipoproteins, the APOB levels, as well as uh, HDLC uh, high density lipoproteins and APOA levels, and they correlated this with uh, the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and they found that they were correlated with increased athero atherosclerotic vascular disease. Uh, so this regarding the evidence, and as we can see, and as uh, Professor Dr. May and uh, Dr. Hussein mentioned earlier, that the problem is that the patients uh, with CKD are not included in many studies, and this uh, we have to, we will uh, we'll observe this in, uh, in uh, reviewing the guidelines. The guidelines doesn't have a clear benefit or a solid, uh, the solid data to, uh, to build upon the recommendations. As we, uh, so the guidelines, uh, as we will see, will uh, not have, a, couldn't make clear statements or clear recommendations regarding this lipidemia. Um, this, uh, the, 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 we talked very much in from the, the start of the presentation about the effect of this lipidemia and the cardiovascular outcome, outcomes and mortality, which is the very important, uh, uh, important relation. But uh, we have also uh, to see uh, if there is any consequences of this lipidemia on the kidney itself. Uh, so this trial, as I mentioned before, uh, they tried to uh, follow up the kidney and they, the transplanted kidney, and there was no difference in the secondary endpoints of graft loss, doubling serum creatinine concentration and decline in the GFR, receiving a fluvastatin or placebo. So they, have, uh, they had no uh, solid data about this. And the single center res retrospective study of 615 consecutive kidney transplant recipients uh, also uh, this uh, single center study didn't find any association of statin use and uh, the patient, uh, the graft or patient survival. Uh, regarding acute rejection, in 2000, 2009, uh, they found no difference in the risk of acute rejection with statin. Uh, then uh, subsequent observational studies and small clinical trials also uh, didn't uh, detect the beneficial role of of statin regarding the, 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 the post-transplant rejection. Uh, 
Uh, I researched in nephrotic syndrome because nephrotic syndrome is different from the CKD in the uh, fact that it, the LDL levels are elevated. And so I searched to see if there is um, uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, mechanisms of action in the statins or uh, different uh, benefits in the statin. And I, I found that there is a lipid nephrotoxicity uh, with uh, highly elevated uh, LDL eleven leads to glomerular injury, proteinuria, increased albumin uptake, podocyte injury, inflammatory cytokines, and uh, uh, cell proliferation, uh, which and also tubular interstitial injury, which both leads to progressive kidney disease. Uh, so, what about um, translating those uh, studies and those benefits uh, in the studies to the treatment and the guidelines? Uh, available evidence argues against the use of LDL concentration to identify people with CKD who should receive statin treatment and suggest focusing on two other factors. Uh, so far, we have also, um, we, not so far, I, th um, I think till 2013. Till 2013, the problem was uh, the LDL level. What level is safe? Is it uh, 100 or 70 in LDL, or is it uh, cholesterol, uh, uh, I mean a number or a level? Uh, however, uh, there was a paradigm shift uh, after the, 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 there is um, the American Heart Association uh, classified the patients into risk stratification and recommended the use of uh, statins or lipid-lowering drugs according to the patient's criteria into uh, moderate intensity or high intensity. And I will show you the, 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 least, the last American Heart Association um, guidelines. And so uh, since then, there is... Um, the, the, there is uh, no benefit in having a, uh, a certain level of LDL. Instead of this, we have to see the absolute risk of coronary events and the evidence that statin treatment is beneficial. So, uh, KDGO guidelines recommends that first we have to rule the remedial causes of secondary hyperlipidemia and then establish the indication of treatment as yes or no. Is it patient indicated for treatment or not? And select agent and what uh, agent is selected. Should we select a statin, for example, or other uh, drug? And then we have to treat according to fire and forget strategy. strategy. This, this strategy is full of criticisms. But this uh, what the guidelines say, and we will discuss it, uh, that we have to give the patient the uh, drug and uh, at the, the intensity uh, uh, that, uh, that is indicated for him and not measure the LDL unless the results would alter the management. So uh, what are secondary causes of This lipid include conditions as um, nephrotic syndrome, hypothyroidism, diabetes, excessive alcohol consumption, and medications. As we, may, uh, we mentioned, the most important of them, the cyclosporin, the sirolimus, the corticosteroids, and also the oral contraceptives, the anticonvulsants, and the highly active uh, antiretroviral drugs, diuretics, and beta blockers. Here, I want you to uh, see this graph. This graph was a... Uh, I, uh, I took this graph from the guidelines. Here, uh, in order to understand the guidelines, uh, the studies show that patients with no CKD, no diabetes, and prior MI uh, then have a lower risk per uh, 1,000 person per year, as you see the column, the white column. And in the, then in the middle of the, of the graph here, uh, then we have um, here patients with CKD, uh, no diabetes, um, uh, CKD uh, diabetes and no prior MI, and CKD with no diabetes and prior MI have the highest level of uh, the highest level of uh, of cardiovascular risk. On the other hand, we have patients below 50 years. So the middle uh, from the middle of the graph, you have on the left patients above eight, uh, 50, and on the right side people people or patients um, below, uh, below 50, okay? Here we see that patients above 50 has a much higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And so the baseline coronary risk is estimated at the 10-year incidence risk of coronary death or non-fatal MI, uh, which is numerically equivalent to the rate of such event per 1,000 patients per year. The case fatality rate uh, and the evidence that pharmacological cholesterol 
medical treatment guide our decision to give the patient the treatment or not. Not a number, not a level, and uh, but only the 10-year risk of coronary uh, heart disease and the case fatality and the evidence from the studies that he will benefit. According, uh, when translating those, uh, those uh, decision-making uh, points, uh, we find the KDW guidelines saying that in adults newly identified CKD with chronic kidney disease or transplantation, we recommend evaluation of lipid profile, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, cholesterol, and triglyceride. And in adults with CKD, follow-up measurement of lipid levels is not required for the major of patients. And here we have the first comment on the guidelines that uh, the, the lipid profile, as we see here, as the general population, LDL and, uh, and total cholesterol and HDL, is not the same one in the CKD population. As we, uh, we, uh, we have uh, data uh, that they have increased, for example, like protein little e. And the guidelines didn't recommend whatsoever measuring the lab protein little e, uh, and uh, they are used only in uh, the studies and not in the general population. The second is uh, not to do a follow-up measurements of lipid level, except in certain cases. Uh, certain cases as, for example, assessment of adherence to statin treatment. Unfortunately, the patients are very uncompliant. They are not compliant at all. They don't uh, realize the benefit of the drug. For example, uh, if compared to the antihypertensive drugs, they take the antihypertensive drugs and they measure blood pressure, find it, uh, well, okay, they have to stick on the antihypertensive drugs. But because the, the statin or the lipid-lowering drugs have a long-term effect and they, um, they protect a lot, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, over the years, and so sometimes patients are frequently non uh, non adherent to those uh, drugs. And uh, we, the second indication to follow up is the change in renal replacement therapy and modality because they may change the lipid profile of the patient. The third, if there is a concern about the presence of new secondary cause of dyslipidemia, uh, as uh, we mentioned, the secondary causes we mentioned and to assess the 10-year cardiovascular risk in patients aged 50 years and not currently receiving statin. In order to calculate the 10-year cardiovascular risk, we have to reassess the lipid profile once more. And these are the indications which are present in the KDGO guidelines. Uh, the second um, guideline or the second item in the guidelines here, uh, this states who will take the drug, who will take the statins, which drug, uh, which patient will take the drug. Uh, the first of all, it is the patient above 50 years. The, because I showed you the slide where the incidence of the risk is much more higher in patients above 50 years. Uh, so we have patients either less than 60 milliliter per minute or more than 60 milliliter per minute GFR. Patients with more than 50 years and less than 60 milliliter per minute, they recommend treatment with a statin or a statin is it immune. As I mentioned in the study of alert, the, the, the study, um, SHARP study, which used the statin with is it immune because to uh, have a, a lowering, more lowering of LDL, uh, in spite of uh, not taking the side effects of elevating the level of the statin. Patients more than 50 years, with uh, GFR more than 60, we recommend treatment also with a statin. Uh, in others, from 18 to 49, but not treated with chronic dialysis or kidney transplantation, we suggest statin treatment in people with one of the following. Those patients from 18 to 49 years should have other risk factors, as uh, the previous MI or diabetes or ischemic stroke or estimated 10-year incidence of coronary death or non fetal uh, myocardial infarction. So, in patients with 18 to 29, the, uh, the, the, the indication is individualized according to the different categories I mentioned in the last slide. Um, what regarding children? Children, in the guidelines, uh, they have, um, the, we uh, recommend evaluation of the lipid profile at the start as the adult population. We suggest annual follow-up at the other population. And those patients less than 18, uh, we suggest that statin not to be initiated. I will comment on the children of the pediatric group at the last, uh, at the, in the last part of the presentation. What about the triglyceride treatment, lowering treatment? And those uh, CKD patients with hypertriglyceridemia, therapeutic life changes advised, and in children also therapeutic life changes advised. Um, the, the fibrates are not 
recommended to prevent pancreatitis, and I will comment on fibrates in the section of the drug treatment. In patients already receiving statins or statin is the combination at the time of dialysis, it suggests that these agents should be continued. Uh, as we see from the, there is no evidence of giving a patient any statin or lipid lowering drugs in patients with on dialysis, but if they are taking them or they are receiving them uh, before at the, the, in the CKD uh, period before the entering di dialysis initiation, uh, but uh, as you see, the level of, uh, uh, of the, the level of evidence is to see. This is the important slide of American Heart Association guideline. Uh, it, uh, the, regarding the primary prevention here, as we see in the second row, they um, here categorize the patients into two, three groups, patients from zero to 19, from 20 to 39, and from 40 to 75. Patients from 40 to 75 should be subjected to, the, uh, to uh, calculate the cardiovascular risk. When we calculate the cardiovascular risk, either you find it above 20% and those are high risk, and, uh, or 7.5 to 20, or less uh, or from 5 to 7.5 and less than 5. Less than 5 is very simple. These patients have very low risk and above 20% uh, is also very simple. They have a straightforward indication to, uh, to, have, uh, to receive a statin. Um, uh, patients from 7.5 to 20, they should take the statin, only they have one of the risk enhancers, which are present in the box here. We find here the third item, the chronic kidney disease, other than family history and uh, comorbidity and inflammatory diseases and so on. But chronic kidney disease is a clear risk enhancer for patients with, uh, with uh, risk, uh, cardiovascular risk from 7.5 to 20. Patients from 5 to 7.5 should be discussed uh, with the patient um, in light of the polypharmacy they taken and uh, the side effects and so on can uh, take the decision with the patient if it is uh, important for him to take it or not. Another point very important is the uh, when we give the patient a statin, we have to give him either a high intensity statin and this will reduce the LDL uh, by 30 to 50 percent or a moderate intensity uh, statin and this also according to the risk. So statin is indicated again in our patients if the predicted absolute risk of having a major cardiovascular event is 7.5 to 10 percent or higher. Statin might be given if the risk is 5 to 7.5. It might be given and not be given if it is less than 5. And so we have the guidelines uh, I tried to, uh, to search for other guidelines. Uh, we, I found the American Society of Endocrinologists still um, get treatment, get, giving us treatment goals for LDL uh, as low as um, uh, 130 in moderate and high risk patients less than 100 and patients with very high risk uh, less than 70 and extreme less than 55. And they here include patients with CKD stages four or five are classified as high, very high, or extremely risk, depending on the presence of other risk factors. And these are other uh, guidelines also, uh, but they uh, have uh, as a targets, they have numbers as the targets, not like the American Heart Association guidelines. Uh, so uh, when uh, some guidelines categorize the patient with chronic kidney disease as having high risk, we should lower the, the, the we should lower the L, low density life proteins. The problem that we meet is that we cannot exceed certain levels of a drug dosage because uh, the patient can be subjected to the side effects of the drugs. These are the drugs side uh, these uh, doses as uh, I uh, I also refer uh, took them uh, as a reference from the KDGO guidelines. Here they have these uh, numbers from the studies which included those references and found no side effects at those doses. I mean, those doses were subjected to many, trial, many studies and they uh, yielded no side effects. Um, and these are the doses. We should not exceed those doses. This is another uh, table which shows also the dose and its relation to the intensity. Here we find the box down uh, the last column, the last row, Rosuba statin. We find that it is a higher intensity, um, high intensity uh, statin, as we see here uh, from the, it is a very important study, but we see here, uh, sorry, a very important uh, statin. Uh, I see here in the dose adjustment in the CKD patient, the maximum dose is from 5 to 10 
And here, uh, if used with second spoon, the maximum dose is five milligram. milligram. We should not exceed those doses because of the side effects uh, of the statins. In 2013, disease, uh, the kidney disease improved in global outcomes. Uh, these are the, uh, the lowering the drug statins, which can be used among transplant recipients. In 2011, there was an alert of synthostatin and cyclosporin, uh, which should not be used together because uh, there is um, uh, side effects from the drug uh, due to drug interaction with cyclosporin. Uh, this um, study, uh, this um, statement uh, about uh, the, the comparison between tacrolimus versus cyclosporine, uh, it is a very recent uh, study and it uh, showed that, that it, there is, um, uh, the, the, uh, and the conclu they concluded that clinicians need to be aware that tacrolimus and cyclosporine are not the same with regard to causing drug interactions with statin. Tacrolimus may be used with statin without the need of those adjustments because lack of interaction. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if the, the, this is according to this study, uh, but in the study they wrote um, many, uh, uh, many information about the pharmacokinetic of the drugs, uh, but also they want to say that uh, we have not, we don't, we don't have to be uh, so much afraid of the drug interactions and the side effects in um, expense of uh, the protection of the cardiovascular disease. Um, other than statins, we have other uh, lipid-lowering drugs, uh, as the ezetimib. Ezetimib leads to lowering of LDL by 20%, as um, we, uh, we, the, this was shown in the SHARP study. And the, study, uh, and the studies show that ezetimib dose of 10 mg daily is safe, tolerable, and effective in patients, even from 10 years. Bile acid sequestrants as cholestyramine, cholestipol, cholezevilam, uh, they are used in combination with the statin and they have potential to interfere with absorption of anterior hepatic circulation of co-administered drugs. So in transplantation, they may, be, uh, they may release, at least lead to a decreased uh, absorption of uh, icophenolate uh, acid products and decreased absorption of cyclosporin and oral corticosteroids when co-administered to bile sequestrants also have been reported. So we have to take care of using them with these drugs. Regarding the omega-3 fatty acids, uh, there, is, um, uh, there was uh, limited data and they are all, always uh, looked at as being as a, being a supplement. Uh, patients take them, they take omega-3 fatty acids and take, they are taking a supplement or a vitamin or something like this. And so um, they found that they lead to slight improvement in the triglyceride levels with fish oil uh, when used in high doses from one to four grams per day. Uh, there is an important study, which is the reduce, uh, reduce it USA, which shows that there is a reduction in the cardiovascular uh, outcomes here uh, by using uh, the omega-3 fatty acids, and they use here the icosapent. And, um, and this is an important study because they are relatively safe drugs. There is no uh, major side effects from this drug. This is another uh, trial you, uh, studying the effect of uh, these drugs on LDL, which is the strength trial. Uh, regarding uh, the uh, fibric acid derivatives, these are uh, the, uh, the, uh, these, uh, these drugs target the high triglyceride level. These are important drugs because we mentioned before that the high triglyceride level is of importance in CKD patients. There are too few participants with GFR uh, 60 milliliter per minute in the either in the field uh, study or the, in the accord study. And uh, this, this study shows that there is relative risk reduction in cardiovascular disease. However, uh, the patients uh, which were uh, included in the phenofibrate study showed increased risk uh, of doubling of the plasma creatinine and also the combination with statin leads to uh, increases uh, in the myopathy risk in with fibric acid derivative and these drugs are absolutely contraindicated in uh, the pediatric age group. Uh, regarding the new role of nutrition, Several nutrition therapies um, uh, were uh, suggested as the Mediterranean diet and a diet rich in fruits and vegetables and poor in uh, so saturated fat and sodium and high fibers diet. Uh, unfortunately, all uh, took the, um, uh, the, the were studies and showed the, there is decreased level of triglyceride or change in the lipid profile, more favorable lipid profile, only uh, 
uh, in uh, the study in the uh, fourth column on CKD patients showed here no significant association between diet and all cause mortality after multivariate adjustment. Other studies didn't address the problem of the cardiovascular disease. It only measured the lipid profile and whether it is favorable or not. Regarding pediatric patients, uh, the cardiovascular mortality, as we know, is increased for pediatric patients with evolving stages of CKD and end-stage renal disease as compared to aged matched peers. Uh, the cardiovascular-related disease is the second leading cause of death behind infections among children and adolescents uh, with uh, uh, kidney transplants. Uh, the patient, the uh, pediatric age group has the traditional risk factors, you know, as family overweight, exposure to tobacco, uh, metabolic syndrome, suboptimal nutrition, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. And also, but the uh, important risk factor is the estimated GFR and the immune uh, suppression. Uh, the, there is strong association in the pediatric age group with tri uh, triglyceride, LDL, um, uh, and um, levels of the pediatric transplant patients. These uh, studies, I, 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 I mentioned them in this table, is uh, to, uh, to concentrate on the children as guidelines. Here we find the second, in the second row, the KIDIGO guidelines. We just mentioned it. Here it, uh, it uh, recommended management, uh, uh, therapeutic life changes only. Statin use was discouraged in the guidelines, the KIDIGO guidelines, and also triglyceride if above 500, so a therapeutic life changes in the form of, I, may, I will mention some example which is important in the pediatric age group, different than the adult group. Uh, however, in the Transplant and Natural Kidney Foundation, uh, the, um, they recommend statin if it remains above uh, 60 and the therapeutic life changes with the statin. Um, and uh, for the regarding uh, triglycerides, if above 500, uh, therapeutic life changes is indicated. Regarding the American Heart Association, they recommended uh, the therapeutic life changes and statin for increased risk if more than 130 and more than 400, they recommended uh, possibly omega-3 fatty acids. Um, uh, in light of the study I just mentioned about the omega-3 fatty acid, maybe it's more used than before. So in spite of that, the children are out of pediatric age group is more subject to the cardiovascular disease or uh, they have increased risk. The guidelines are not very clear about giving them statins or not giving the drug and they, uh, they um, only uh, men uh, recommend therapeutic life changes. And they are not uh, included in any of the study. The, in the alert, group, in the alert study, for example, the least uh, age was 30, so they were not included in this study. Regarding the children age group, there are some, uh, some uh, special advices for the children um, in, inside, uh, beside the nutrition education and counseling to promote heart healthy. They are recommended to have regular physical activity with the goal of 60 minutes of active play and limiting screen time, television, computer, and video games to two hours per day or less. Uh, I guess this advice is also for the, uh, for the older also, not for the adult also. Or recommendations for adults uh, or for adolescents is the physical activity for 20 to 30 minutes period of walking, swimming, and supervised activity within the ability. Dietary modification used judiciously, as if all in children who are malnourished, with LDL more than 130 or for those who are overweight, they are advised to have heart-friendly fats as canola or olive oil, and they have um, uh, they are encouraged to have legumes and soluble fiber. And in studies who followed diets with less than 30% total calories, with 7% calories from saturated fat, 10% polyunsaturated fat, and less than 200 gram milligram per day cholesterol, those patients had 11% and 14% reductions in triglycerides and LDL levels. The pediatric doses are slightly different. They are uh, more, uh, more uh, yeah, less than uh, adult group. Uh, and these are, these are the reference for the uh, pediatric group um, statins if used, although the KEDIGO guidelines recommend the, uh, only the therapeutic life changes. Uh, the last point in my presentation will be the emerging lipid low, uh, lowering treatment. As we uh, know, uh, we know we have these uh, statins and all the drugs we have didn't have a favorable cardiovascular outcome or the, the, those uh, results we expect. So there are other uh, emerging lipid lowering treatment. Hope 
hopefully they will have this effect. I will highlight three of them, the PCSK9, CETB, and uh, the drugs acting on the lipoprotein little a. Uh, here are these newer agents with our PCSK9, they are proteases. Here, as you see, the left column, here the, the lower uh, LDL cholesterol combined with the receptor and become internalized and then recycled to be incorporated and, uh, uh, and uh, emerge on the surface once more. On the other hand, the presence of PCSK9 will lead to degradation of the receptor. When the receptor, LDL receptor, is degraded, it cannot combine with the LDL, so the LDL is elevated. So we use the inhibitor of PCSK9 in order to, uh, to, um, uh, to have the LDL receptor upregulated and combined with the, uh, with the LDL to lower its effect to be internalized in the liver. And so this, uh, this, is, uh, this study is the Alirutumab and cardiovascular outcomes after acute coronary syndrome. Uh, it, is, it was published in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. It shows that there is uh, a <coughs> uh, favorable effect. And um, it, um, it showed favorable effect of the uh, drug. And it was given subcutaneously, uh, but uh, it is only at the, level, uh, the studies level and it is not used uh, now um, clinically. I mean, it's not, um, it's not yet used. Uh, this um, part of the study, the Odyssey outcome, uh, they, uh, this, uh, they, they took patients with uh, CKD patients. And they found in this part of the study that the drug ha may have efficacy and safety profile comparable to that of patients with normal renal function, uh, and that it is comparable to patients which have a GFR more than 60. Uh, cholesterol ester uh, transfer protein, these uh, proteins mediate the exchange between the lipids, cholesterol ester between the triglyceride and the mature HDL and thus modifying the lipid composition of high-density lipoprotein. They are also uh, now uh, studied to be used. Uh, also, um, they, have, uh, they are studying uh, inhibitors of lipoprotein little a synthesis uh, and found that uh, nicotinic acid, PCSK9, and uh, cetrapib, such as uh, anacetrapib, have shown to have lower, uh, lower LPA levels in studies. Concluding remarks, an independent graded inverse relationship exists between cardiovascular risk and estimated uh, GFR. Patients with end-stage renal disease are extremely high risk of cardiovascular events. In chronic kidney disease, dysregulation of lipid metabolism results in increased levels of triglyceride, oxidized lipoproteins, reduced level of HDL, LDL cholesterol levels are usually normal. And this is the difference, again, between them and the general population. Approach to the kidney disease of CKD patients with this lipidemia includes to rule out first remediable causes of secondary hyperlipidemia, take the decision, is the patient eligible or not for treatment, and take the drug and revise the dose. Uh, so we have to follow up the lipid profile when indicated, as we mentioned, the indications of lipid profile. Response of statin diminishes in later stages of CKD. When you, we have advanced stages of CKD, the response is not as, the, as the, the, the other stages. And in dialysis patients, there is no role for the statin benefit. Don't give any benefit in the dialysis patients. But in patients already receiving statin or statin is a immune combination, at the time of dialysis, these agents can be continued. There is obvious room for greater reduction in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in CKD beyond LDL lowering with statin, highlighting the need for other therapeutic targets. I hope it was not too long, and thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mona, for this uh, overview, very nice overview about lipid disorders in CKD dialysis and transplantation. Really, uh, it is uh, very comprehensive, and I think it uh, will open uh, some points for discussion. To start with, I like the uh, the way of prescription to start step by step. And in the nephrology literature in CKD, up to this moment, there is no strong evidence that statins are nephroprotective. So they protect, we use them in CKD for the sake of the heart, for the sake of cardiovascular system, not for the sake of the kidney. Uh, the second point, when we uh, prescribe them with immune suppressive drugs, as you mentioned, we should take care of drug-drug interactions, usually with, with cyclosporin. 
And a form of a step, as we discussed before in the interaction between these synthetic drugs, cyclosporin inhibits the metabolism of statin. This is why there are some statins, as you mentioned in your presentation. Uh, if the, do you hear me, Dr. Mona? Yes. Yes, I hear you. Yes. So cyclosporin uh, uh, inhibits metabolism of statin. This will elevate the level of statin to the extent yes. that this may lead to uh, rhabdomyosis. Rhabdom rhabdom yes, yes. So we should be careful about this point. Uh, mm. For example, if we use a torvastatin, 10 milligram with cyclosporin is 10 milligram, not, not 20 even uh, with CKD. So it's 10 milligram because this is the highest dose of cyclosporin. Yes. Uh, the, regarding the other drugs the, in the future, the BCSK9, which is fantastic to keep LDL receptor working. Uh, I think we are in eager need for trials for using these drugs in nephrology because still their use in CKD dialysis and transplantation is lacking. And from the theoretical point of view, I think there is no restriction to use them. Uh, regarding simvastatin, we uh, have published a study including 11 patients highly sensitized on dialysis waiting transplantation. So we use them at the time in combination of, with uh, IVIG to reduce the level of antigen antibodies. And we failed to desensitize them and we got the sense that a statin doesn't add anything in desensitization of patients waiting transplantation. I, I, should, I, I would like to stop here to allow the, uh, the uh, Professor May to continue the discussion and then to have the questions and comments from our colleagues. Dr. May. I mean, this. Please unmute yourself, Dr. May. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mona. Very informative uh, talk, really, and very updated. And so uh, we can say that for our CKD patients below 50 years, we, with no risk factors, we don't treat. And above 50 years, uh, we treat. And uh, we are uh, we have to fix our dose at the recommended dose, and then we don't follow up uh, at all. And we don't initiate treatment uh, in dialysis patients unless they are already on medication. So we continue. I am waiting for uh, for questions, and it seems that your talk was very clear. Uh, I don't see any. Yes, I, do, I don't agree with not following up the patient. Is in uh, regarding the transplantation patient, they are followed up at least uh, and not changing anything in the dose except after one month. And then uh, every three months, it is uh, this better. I think to uh, I will want to hear also your opinion, but to follow uh, to, to follow them then up in transplantation patients, for example, and in other CKD patients. Maybe the patient uh, gets not compliant to the drug, so we have to For check the indications. Yes. Mm, yes. Though it is stated that uh, should shouldn't be followed out, but I don't agree with this statement. Uh, but the point is that you are um, you will have to you 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 not exceed your maximum dose. For instance, if you give uh, a tovrasat, it's going to be twenty. It's not going to be. It's never going to be forty. So yes. if you find it elevated, you will not uh, be able to raise the dose. But yes. it's, uh, on the other hand, important to, and this applies to transplant group too, right? Yes. So you don't yes. increase the dose at the general population. So we should know our limit. Yes, yes. In transplant patients, uh, it depends upon graft function and the presence of uh, so, uh, the other risk factors. So if we have diabetic coronary transplant patients with preserved graft function without cyclosporin, <laughs> we can minimize, maximize the dose up to the maximum dose, 80 milligram uh, atorvastatin. The restriction in transplantation if, is if he has normal cyclosporin, graft cyclosporin and poor graft function. Yes. Uh, yes. We have now Professor Tayel Baz. It is my pleasure to have him again with us in these meetings. So the mic is to Professor Tayel Baz. Uh, sincere greetings to everybody and really Professor Ramona uh, it was a very very uh, comprehensive uh, talk uh, you didn't leave a point uh, I just like to make a further 
comment to what uh, Professor Shaisha said about uh, the newcomer, the P uh, CK9. Uh, it is a wonderful drug, yes. Uh, but I think this particular drug, monoclonal antibody, yeah. is a, a very expensive drug, should be uh, limited only to those patients who really need it. As we all know, the patients with the f familial hypertriglyceridemia. So whether we have a CKD patient or a, or a non-CKD patient, I think this could be uh, uh, of great value for this type of patients. We understand how expensive this drug is, although it is uh, very beneficial. Another point you, uh, you, you mentioned, and I like that very much, the use of statins to delay the progression of CKD. Yes, some years back, there were various trials regarding the use of statins because of their anti-proliferative uh, uh, properties, particularly in diabetic nephropathy. But the question I would like to ask, maybe there isn't any trial done yet uh, to specify the use. I mean, can we use statins now freely just for this sole indication, the prevention of progression of CKD? You did show a couple of trials uh, in your presentation, but I don't think there's any solid evidence to use it as we use whatever uh, guidelines uh, tell us in prevention of progression. What about this particular part? No, there is no studies dedicated to the progression of uh, of uh, of, uh, of kidney disease. It is only a part of. It was a part of other study which is addressing the cardiovascular disease. And uh, the last evidence was the meta analysis, which were published and comparing all the all the all the, the, the statins, all the types of statins uh, regarding the, 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 the effect on the kidney. But there was no dedicated uh, use only for the kidney. If you allow me, Professor Baz, about the, the, the point of BCSK9, yes, we use them in refractory hypercholesterolemia and familiarly, familiar hypercholesterolemic patients because they will die eventually if LDL is, is not controlled. So this is why this is the, the best indication to use them. And we can use them in our patients if we fail to control uh, LDL in high-risk patients. So, so their, their role is there, but in a special situation. I think one of emerging rules is the, if we have uh, the patients treated with immature inhibitors, because it was proven from experimental studies that the main mechanism of hypercholesterolemia in immature inhibitor treated patients is uh, interference with BCSK. So it increases BCSK9. This is why in patients with uh, immature inhibitors, if uh, hypercholesterolemia is refractory to statins, I think there may be a place for these newcomers to be used. Again, the limitations, the limitation is the cost and the mode of administration, they are injection. And so this, this, this is why they both uh, as a last report. Regarding using statin uh, for primary aim, uh, aiming for primary delaying the progression of CKD, no, there is no evidence for this point at all. And to the contrary of meta-analysis mentioned by Professor Mona, there is a nice meta-analysis published in one of the uh, very high uh, ranked journals on the cardiology last year, showing that even statins may impair kidney function. So you we may find some studies saying statins improve uh, individual dysfunction, they may reduce proteinuria, and the other extent they may impair kidney function. So they are primarily cardiac drugs and not kidney drugs. They are not beneficial. And in this meta-analysis, they showed that uh, rosal statin is superior to atorva statin regarding renal <coughs> dysfunction. So it's right. better to stick uh, to, to a road, particular yes. guideline uh, that states that if a patient is already on statin, don't stop it, uh, but don't start it, do, uh, the drug to use uh, the novo. Uh, yes. 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 In and there is a note here in the dialysis patients. If we have younger patients with multiple risk factors, on individual cases, a statin may be initiated. So this is the complementary to the guidelines. Because the guidelines, as, the, as always you uh, teach us, 
no size fits all. So we should uh, individualize our treatment. But in the majority of patients, we need to initiate statins and dialysis patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Baz, for uh, being with us. Doctor thank, you, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Doctor Ramadan Arafa. Doctor Hussein, Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. My question is not in CKD, in acute kidney injury and statins, without any evidence of rhabdomyolysis. Uh, do we have any difference in the type, regarding the type of the statin from rosuvastatin or atorvastatin uh, in the incidence of acute kidney injury without uh, rhabdomyolysis? Without? Uh, you mean uh, one of them is safer uh, over the others? Yes. No, I have no information, but uh, I have uh, studies about uh, contrast nephropathy. They can be used to, uh, uh, they are used in some studies to prevent contrast, uh, uh, contrast uh, nephropathy. But uh, there is no mention about, uh, as far as I know, may maybe Dr. May or Dr. Hussein can answer this question. Well, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate you, Professor Mona, about mentioning use of statin, high dose, very procedural to reduce contrast induced acute kidney injury. Either rosuvastatin 40 or atorvastatin 80 milligram before doing, but, but the evidence is not yet strong. But this is, so long as we give it one, one dose or two doses is fine to be added to the patients because if the patient is ischemic, coronary heart disease patients, this means that the statin is indicated for atherosclerosis. Uh, uh, I'm not aware by the drugs by the acute kidney injury and the statin relationship, but it may be indirect, uh, maybe rhabdomyolysis, uh, maybe a small strength, myopathies or myositis. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of issues to be. Uh, uh, yes. The point that Hassan, shall I uh, add a small point? Yeah. Um, uh, so there are some papers regarding the rosuvastatin. It may worsen the renal function, and we noticed after acute MI in, uh, in our hospital. But it is a uh, self-experience with me and with our cardiology team. Uh, rosuvastatin, high, high dose rosuvastatin, 20 or uh, or. Um, high. Uh, those, as you mentioned, yes, it is. Uh, I found uh, there is a slide here. I showed you that rosuvastatin. It was in the bottom of the table. It uh, it is one of the uh, of the. Potent. I mean, the uh, high intensity, high intensity yeah. stat. And I noticed uh, also in the maybe you noticed this in your outpatient clinics that patients are taking very high doses of uh, of this drug. Maybe the the uh, the doctors uh, prescribe them, uh, consider it like atorvastatin or something like that. Sometimes the patients are taking really overdosing. They are taking mm -hmm. higher doses of the drug, and maybe this is the cause of uh, doing a rhabdomyolysis or side if showing the side effects of the drug. Uh, the second thing in patients with transplantation, uh, only when drug interactions occur, and yeah, maybe drug interactions may occur, and so they uh, will elevate the level of the drug, and uh, so the, the level is actually uh, higher than the dose the patient is taking. Okay, but yeah. if it's the patient has a baseline normal kidney function, and the patient is very high risk, coronary diabetic, we use the high intensity dose. High intensity yes, yes. Dose to bring a but if you have interaction yes, with, yes. with the drugs that are having. And the two monitor, it, the, the, the message is, whatever the necessity of the drug, we should monitor the patient well to, uh, to address <laughs> the occurrence of problem and to uh, manipulate the man management yes. according to the complications. Uh, the, there is uh, something also stated in the guidelines. I found in the guidelines, uh, there is a statement about to the drug taking uh, uh, statin and he is taking for example an antibiotic or any uh, drug which acts on the microsomal uh, the, the enzyme that so it elevates the level of uh, turvastatin and there are clear rules when to stop the drug and when to reduce the dose. For example, if the drug is temporary as an antibiotic, for example, uh, you have to reduce the dose uh, if you're taking for a long time. And if it is taken only for three days, you can remain the dose. There are clear uh, clear uh, guidelines written in the guidelines of the Kidigo guidelines regarding normal, sick, um, I mean, CKD patients without transplantation. There are also other, we are concentrating on the drug interactions with the transplantation patient. There are also uh, drug interactions in other CKD patients. Maybe... Drug, <laughs> drug, drug interactions are essential. Yeah, yes. and you remind me by the clarithromycin, for example. Yes. Clarithromycin, 
inhibits the cytochrome B system, so it will elevate the statins metabolized by cytochrome system, and also interferes with transporters, uh, organic anion transporters. So it elevates the level of non-metabolized statin. So uh, whenever we prescribe drug, we should we should be careful because we may induce harm. For example, uh, uh, this drug can be given for longer period with uh, treating the helicobacter pylori, depending upon unnecessary testing done to, to the patients. So we should yes. review medications and to review the medication before introducing any new drug to respect the drug-drug interactions. Uh, uh, if you allow me, Professor May, to uh, look at the question in the chat, because we have... Uh, yes, yeah, sure, sure. And I invite, I invite uh, Dr. Mohammed Hadidi. Dr. Mohammed Hadidi, please uh, read the question in the chat. Uh, okay, we, we, have, we have two questions. Uh, the first one is from uh, Dr. Safwat Nazmi. He's asking about uh, if we shall prescribe uh, statin or phenofibrate to CKD patients who is estimated GFR less than 45 uh, and serum triglyceride is more than 1,500, uh, 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 5, uh, 1, sorry, and uh, he has ischemic heart disease with uh, uh, ejection fraction uh, 40%. Shall we prescribe statin or phenofibrate for this patient? It's about the use the combination of statin and phenofibrate. No, not a combination. Statin or phenofibrate. Uh, and phenofibrate. So the level of the level of triglyceride is very high, one thousand five hundred. So in this situation, we can expect. Uh, a retinal affection and pancreatic pancreatitis. So yes. I, I think uh, we use uh, we are obliged to treat this uh, this patient. If this it, is the situation, it, 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 Dr. Ramona, which yes, um, you prefer? I, I mean, these these levels are are indication. So, uh, we start with fibrates and which fibrates to be used. Is it, is it or the combination of both? Is the question about the combination, the safety of the combination, or? If, if this is the case, and you will prescribe drugs, which should drug Dr. Mona to, to uh, select and to prescribe? Uh, I will, uh, the, the patient, the CKD patient, or the normal? Yes, CKD patient, uh, GFR above uh, 45. But are not preferred in the CKD patients because they may cause rise of the serum creatinine, but in, in patients above uh, 1,000, uh, we can uh, use them very carefully with monitoring of serum creatinine and with very low dose. We can use the low dose of the fibrates and uh, very reduced dose and try to elevate it, but very reduced dose and the follow up of the serum creatinine. And also concomitantly with the therapeutic lifestyle modifications, they have to, um, to, uh, to, to reduce the fats in diet and to go concomitantly uh, with the, the diet, uh, dietary regimen. So in this very high level, uh, I think we should treat Yes, yes, I mean was then, to Brazil and the, then to just to close yes. monitoring the patient because yes, this yes. is a very risky and we may lose this patient if we uh, yes. neglect the treatment. In this I mean level. both together. Okay. I meant only both together with the, with the, the lowest level and with the monitoring of the serum creatinine. Okay. Dr. Hadiri? A second question is from Dr. Khaled about whether the patient should pass uh, before uh, performing a lipid profile test. Yes, what is written in the in the guide in the studies, the patient should not fast. Only when there is abnormality, the patient should fast and do another test. As as like, uh, but as a screening, uh, it is not recommended to fast. But I know that all the the labs in Egypt they um, they insist on fasting 12 hours. But what is written in the Kidigo guidelines is that the patient, uh, when we do it as a screening test, the patient is not, uh, not it is not mandatory to fast, but only when the, 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 we find an abnormality, we have to tell the patient to repeat the test with fasting. It's better, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean what I do, my, I bond, the, my bond, Dr. Mona, if, uh, if I am uh, targeting complete life gram, including LDL, very LDL, yes, the, the patient should fast. Yes, but it's if it's just serum cholesterol, total cholesterol, it's not essential to be fasting because the uh, impact of fasting is negligible in this issue. Yes, 
فورتريجلسرايد ذا بيشنت شوت فورت يس تريجلسرايد بيكوز يس دي ار دي ويل دي ار ان ذا سيركيليشن افتر ميلز بات وات وي دو اكتشولي Uh, is that we uh, we uh, instruct the patient to fast for 12 hours, but I the, I only were meant to uh, to to say what is written exactly in the guideline. Okay, Okay, we have two more questions. Uh, one from Dr. Abdul Rahman is asking if uh, omega-3 drug has any role in the treatment of hypertriglyceridemia. It is uh, according to the study reduce it. They have a role. This is a recent study, which was recently published, and maybe it will be further studies in another study, which is ongoing now. It's called strength study, though, uh, and it, it is an attractive option because it doesn't have much side effects. Uh, up till now, it is not present in the guidelines, but these new studies may add to the guidelines. But if the patient is treated with omega-3 fatty acid, and we decide to do renal biopsy, we should be careful because this may increase the bleeding risk. Because it has uh, omega-3 has antiplatelet effect, and one of the very fantastic trial published last year about the role of omega-3 fatty acid to protect the kidney in diabetic patients, it is not protective. Uh, so this is but uh, for trials, but I think it is it is good to be added as a supplementary treatment for hypertriglyceridemia. Habibi. Okay, last question from the chat is about the role of plasma parasites in the treatment of severe uh, hypertriglyceridemia. Yes, it is present in the in patients with uh, familial hypertriglyceridemia or cholesterolemia. Hypertriglyceridemia. Hypertriglyceridemia. I think yes. LDL apheresis is dedicated for LDL. LDL. Yes, for LDL. Yes. LDL uh, only. Okay. Dr. Saeed Hamiz. Uh, thank you, Professor Hassan. Thank you, Professor Mona and Professor Mai. It was very elegant uh, presentation as usual. Uh, I have no uh, more uh, comment, but only two short questions. In a patient with uh, long-standing nephrotic syndrome and dyslipidemia, is there is any rationale to start statins? And if so, is there is any study denoting that it has a good effect or beneficial effect on proteinuria? That's number one. Number two, if there is a patient with uh, uh, rhabdomyolysis... This, this question, Dr. Saeed, let us uh, answer this question, Dr. Amuna. Yeah. About yes, the I, nephrotic uh, syndrome and the hypercholesterolemia and nephrotic. Uh, yes, I showed you a, a slide about the nephrotic uh, syndrome in my presentation that uh, the excess lipids, the excess uh, elevated levels may have a deleterious effect on the kidney uh, regarding the mes uh, mesangial cells and also the interstitial yeah. cells to increase proteinuria. But uh, regarding the guidelines, there is no specific guidelines for nephrotic syndrome. They should they should take the the, the they they are uh, risk at risk patient uh, as the the CKD patients. They have to take the statins, uh, and uh, because uh, may uh, because it uh, for the for cardiac protection and also for the kidney because uh, excess lipid may lead to the lipid toxicity that the picture that I showed you in the graph. I yeah. think Dr. Saeed, the common sense is, is good in this uh, issue. If we have a nephrotic in child and we expect minimal change to, that will respond to steroid, so here there is no need to treat the patient uh, regarding hypertensibremia because yeah. uh, if the uh, nephrotic remit, everything will be fine. But if it is persistent and steroid resistant nephrotic and the prolonged it and the patient is aged, I think uh, to, to treat. So treatment and no treatment depend, is dependent upon expected response to the state and the age and the accompanying comorbidities. Yeah. Uh, second and last question, if there is a patient, uh, unfortunately, with uh, severe rhabdomyolysis secondary to the statins and develop the AKI necessitating uh, dialytic therapy or support of dialytic therapy, uh, is these drugs are dialyzable itself also or not? Thank you. I don't, I don't know. I don't have the answer, unfortunately. Uh, regarding statin, Dr. Saeed, I prefer not to memorize is, it, is this drug dialyzable? Is it dialyzable by hemodialysis or dialysis? Just, just to review the table of the dialyzability. And um, uh, we can review it and we can add it as a commentary on the, the video. So we can yes. add it as a yeah, comment. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, please, yeah. Professor Saeed, review it and add it as a commentary. 
these drugs, the list of antihistamine drugs, what is the state of dialysability for each of them? I will thank you. Or you can give it post dialysis if you are not sure. You can give it post dialysis. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because thank you. We thank have, you. We, we have common sense for dialysability of the drug. Is it maybe soluble, water soluble, broken down, not broken down, nuclear waste? So instead of uh, imagining, uh, it is better to stick to the rule of the eligibility of the drug. All right, you are. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, uh, do, do, uh, Dr. Hadid, do you have any further questions? Uh, no, Dr. Hussein, no further questions in the chat. Thank you very much. Dr. Tanitan do you like to add any um, uh, feedback or comments? أه الأول السلام عليكم كل سنة طيبين سعيد جدا بالمحاضرة بتاعت يوم الجمعة والديسل بيديميا وسكريستال كليب وكلنا استفادنا وبرضو الدكتور سعيد برضو في موضوع الدايلازابيلتي والدراجز دي تقشوا يعني بعيد شوية لكن تبوت المايند إن شاء الله إن شاء الله إن شاء الله سألك يا دكتور طارق Okay, Dr. Amai. Uh, thank I you. Think, thank I you think, very much, I, I think Dr. Mona. It's now to conclude the presentation. Yes, yes. yes. And, and, and thanks for all the attendees. And, and really, it's, it's very important to, uh, to put this issue in mind always when you deal with our CKD patients. Thank you very much, Professor Mona. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you very much, Professor Mona. Uh, thank it's, you. It's very comprehensive, very uh, nice, and it adds a lot to the our uh, scientific library for the uh, care of our patients. Thank you uh, all for attending. And lastly, I would like to thank and appreciate uh, Professor May for moderating this session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.